Today, we'll be going over the stride Starship is making towards its first flight attempt to 50,000 feet. Then we'll debrief this week's 13th Starlink mission and discuss additional Starlink news, check in on Starman, and finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Starship serial number 8, or SN8, underwent a productive week of stress tests as it progresses towards its 15-click flight in fall. On Sunday night, SpaceX engineers in Boca Chica, Texas, filled her up with ambient nitrogen gas in a first round of leak checks. All must have gone according to plan, because about 24 hours later on Tuesday morning, the first of a series of cryo tests began, forming some condensation on the outer hull. Then another 24 hours later on Wednesday morning, condensation was replaced with frost, as the vessel's lower LOX tank was first filled with liquid nitrogen, followed by its upper methane tank. A few hours later, Elon took to Twitter to inform us of how she performed. The cryopressure test succeeded, but a small leak opened up near the engine mounts, possibly due to differential shrinking. Ah, chemistry. A pain to learn and an even bigger pain to teach. A subject so difficult that it even humbles Elon at times. And yet... It is fascinating, <laughs> really. The test still hit 7 bar absolute though, which is fine for flight. This was a proof test rather than a burst test or test of failure. We'll hopefully fix the leak today and retest, which they did. Later that night and into Thursday morning, a second full cryo test was done, again on both tanks, and it still must not have went perfectly because they did yet another cryo proof this morning. But this time it was a great success. High five! <laughs> No word yet on exactly what the next step is. Will SN8 receive her nose or just go straight to the first of two static fires? No road closures are scheduled at the time I'm filming this, but I would be shocked if we didn't see movement this weekend. I want this Sadly, we do have an in memoriam this week. SN7.1 is no longer with us. After losing her cool and blowing her lid, she was toppled like a statue at an Antifa rally and was barbarically chopped up into little pieces. It's murder. But check this out, Brandon put a really sweet rendering together for the community, showing the status of all starships currently under construction. If you're on Twitter, make sure you follow him, his link is in the description below, and he's still doing his weekly diagrams too. This one is of the first Super Heavy booster. Elon responded that the high bay in which it will be stacked should be finished within a few weeks, however the giant gantry crane that will be used to do so won't be yet. But stacking should at least begin around that time. And as far as its orbital launch mount is concerned, Elon is aspiring to leave out a flame diverter, but admitted that doing so could turn out to be a mistake. Flame diverters are used under launch pads for a number of different reasons. One is to prevent rocket engines from digging sinkholes under their stands and swallowing them up, and another is to prevent damage to the rockets themselves. And finally, astronaut Farmer Bob got the chance to fly over the SpaceX facilities this week in a NASA jet. His wingman was there to capture some pretty epic shots. What a magical place it is. I believe in magic! But let's move on now and debrief this week's Starlink mission. On Tuesday morning, SpaceX powered their 13th flock of Starlink satellites into orbit upon a reused Falcon 9 booster. The same one that took Bob and Doug to space earlier in the summer and later launched for the Anasys 2 mission. This particular Starlink mission was slightly different than the others in that the second stage performed an additional two second burn to give those sats an extra push into a circular orbit. And soon after, the shiny space doves were released, bringing the tally up to just a few handfuls away from 800. Elon tweeted that once they reach their target position, they will be able to roll out a fairly wide public beta in northern US and hopefully southern Canada. Other countries to follow as soon as we receive regulatory approval. Because of the pandemic and their remote location in Washington, the Ho tribe was given access to the Starlink constellation, writing that they felt like they had been paddling upriver with a spoon on trying to connect with the rest of the world. But Starlink made it happen overnight. And it seemed like out of nowhere, SpaceX just came up and just catapulted us into the 21st century. Elon responding, you are most welcome. But anyway, back to the mission at hand. The active fairing for this launch was caught during the live stream. The passive fairing was fished out of the water. Both were captured by local photographer Greg Scott yesterday upon their safe return to port. The booster made a bullseye landing on the autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, and just read the instructions was also being tugged around out there at the time. What's your name? What? The booster made it back to the port safely this morning. Elon says SpaceX is aiming to fly a single booster more than 10 times by the end of next year and that so far there's not a whole lot of notable differences to be seen between refurbishing after a couple flights and refurbishing after a handful of flights. 
Eventually, some of the smaller COPVs will need to be replaced. Also, maybe the turbo pump hot sections of the Merlin engines. SpaceX is no longer pursuing a 24-hour turnaround for Falcon 9. Roughly a week or two is all that's needed to meet max launch demands. Starship Super Heavy is designed for reflight in less than an hour. Their future plans for Starship is the reason Falcon 9 will fall from the spotlight. You just can't compete with a 100% reusable rocket that can take more tons of LEO and for cheaper. We'll talk a little bit more about reusability at the end of the episode, but first we have a little bit more Starlink news to go over. For the first time, SpaceX has received an order for some satellites from the Space Development Agency after winning a $149 million contract. Their task will be to develop four defensive satellites that can detect and track ballistic and hypersonic missiles by September of 2022. Of course, SpaceX will just be modifying their current Starlink sats that are produced in Washington State by equipping them with a wide field of view overhead persistent infrared sensor made by an unnamed outside subcontractor. And finally, to round this out, SpaceX gave us an update on Starman's current location in the solar system. Last seen leaving Earth, he has made his first close approach with Mars on Wednesday, coming within 5 million miles of the red planet. Now it's time for today's honorable mention. In an ironic turn of events, this week Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, made their intentions public to build their own version of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket just a couple of decades after quite literally spitting Elon out of their country. I got demoted for being too generous with the gravy. <laughs> their Amir launch vehicle will be a two-stage methane-fueled rocket, smaller than the Falcon 9 at 55 meters tall. Roscosmos stated that their reason for developing a methane rocket engine was simply because companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin have proven it worth doing. And yes, like the Falcon 9, the Amira rocket's booster will use grid fence and deployable legs to land at predetermined coastal landing zones. The Russian Space Agency wants to get it flying by 2026. Better late than never on innovation, I guess, but they may be a day late and 90 billion rubles short. By 2026, Elon wants to be hosting parties on Mars, brought to you by a 100% reusable rocket. His official response to this news was that it's a step in the right direction at least, but they should really be aiming for full reusability. Larger rockets would also make sense for literal economies of scale. Goal should be to minimize cost per useful ton to orbit, or it will at best serve a niche or niche market. Yeah, I'd have to agree with at best. Once Starship gets flying on a regular basis, its capability, availability, and low cost is going to disrupt the market, probably even more so than Falcon 9 did. But if you'd like to know more about this specific topic, I went over it in greater detail in this week's midweek episode for eccentric members. You can find it by signing up using the links in the description below. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to all my eccentric members and patrons who give to keep these videos churning. You all have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed. Godspeed.